This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. In November of 1991, an exuberant high school dance in Santa Clara, California was marred by unexpected tragedy when a 15-year-old boy was struck down long before his time. He would die within an hour, the victim of a baffling, unknown illness. The death of Frank Santos, Jr. was the latest blow for his family, which has been tormented by an incurable heart disease for more than 30 years. Perhaps someone watching tonight can finally provide a clue that will help this courageous family. Join me for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. December 31st, 1960, the American territory of Guam, 3,000 miles west of the Hawaiian Islands. Shortly after midnight, Donna Tilla Santos and her 34-year-old husband, Francisco, were sound asleep. Now about 1.30 that morning, he starts snoring, and he never snored in his life, you know, ever since we were married. I never experienced any snore. So I start waking him up because that's very unusual. He won't wake up. I started crying and he still won't wake up. I lift him up, you know, halfway and I let him lean against me. But then all of a sudden he took his last breath and that was it, he was gone. Francisco's death was initially attributed to a stroke but was later determined to be the result of heart failure Donna Tiller was left to raise seven young children by herself. For Donna Tiller Santos, the death of her husband was only the beginning. In the past decade, five more family members have fallen to a mysterious, undiagnosable disease. Today, Donna Tiller lives in Yuba City, California. She hopes that by presenting her story, someone will be able to help identify this deadly affliction which has plagued the Santos family for three generations. By 1970, Donna Tiller had remarried and moved with her children and new husband to Northern California. Then in April of 1981, the Santos family experienced another sudden tragedy. 27-year-old Doris, the youngest daughter, was found unconscious in her bedroom. She was half on, half off the bed, you know, and normally Doris keeps herself all covered up. So I tried to wake her up, you know, to scoot in, you know, cover herself up, and she wouldn't, you know, she didn't respond. So I ran over and I called my mom. He starts knocking at my door and says, Mom, wake up, because something's wrong. Doris don't want to wake up immediately. I jump out, out of bed, went into her bedroom, and I start waking her up, and she won't wake up. I told my son, Steve, I said, call the paramedic and the priest immediately. Doctors determined that Doris had died of acute congestive heart failure, resulting from the ventricle's inability to pump sufficient amounts of blood to the body. Doctors drew no parallels between Doris's death and the condition that killed her father. Within two years of Doris's death, 23-year-old Ronnie, the baby of the family, began experiencing chest pains. At the time, he was engaged to his high school sweetheart, Dana. Ronnie was found to have a virus of the heart muscle, which could be controlled by medication. I was scared, but I thought, well, he's under a good doctor's care and things will be fine. I'm, I didn't, it was, it was not related to what had happened to Doris because it was a virus of the heart muscle and hers was congestive heart failure. And as far as I knew, his father died of a stroke. 
So they obviously weren't related in my mind. By the following September, Ronnie and Dana had married. Under a doctor's supervision, Ronnie was able to live a normal, active life, which included weekly games of softball. It was a Monday, and I was sitting out and talking to a friend. And they had played a half of an inning. They had been out in the field, and they came in. Not There hadn't been much action. He hadn't been running around or anything. He just kind of been fielding a few balls. And he came in, and he was standing by the backstop, talking to a few friends, leaning on a bat. Ronnie! I'm gonna go call help. Ronnie! He was groaning and moaning, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. And I was just standing there screaming. All I could do was scream and point. I had no idea what was happening. Ronnie! Ronnie Santos never regained consciousness. He was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. The cause of death? Cardiomyopathy, an irregular heartbeat, probably the result of a viral infection. I still can't believe at 24 he was gone. It's, it's such a shock to think that it's just too young. Too many things to live for. A year later, the Santos family was forced to face yet another funeral. This time, the victim was the eldest son, 33-year-old Frank, who collapsed while sitting at home watching television. His mother and I were, were out running errands, and um, we received a phone call. And um, I just remember she got off the phone, and she said, um, she was in a, in a panic state, and she said, we've got to go. We've got to go. Something's wrong. Something happened to Frank. We were driving back to my house, and um, his mother was on the passenger side, and she was praying. And I saw the shadows from the lights of the paramedics truck. And um, then it hit me, and I knew, I knew something was, was wrong. I ran into the house, and I stopped right at, at the dining room, looking into the family room. And I saw the, the uh, paramedics working on, on my husband. And, and I knew, I knew he was gone. It was just in a great shock. I couldn't believe my other son is leaving. And I, I told myself, he cannot leave. He's my oldest son. And he, he cannot, he's not supposed to die. But he was gone. Tragically, Francisco Santos and three of his children had died of heart disease before reaching the age of 35. Physicians searched for answers and soon discovered that heart disorders had plagued Francisco's side of the family for a number of generations. I think that what's most mysterious about the family is uh, the fact that uh, none of the family members um, who died um, were thought to have abnormal hearts uh, prior, to, prior to, to dying. And most of them have had post-mortem examinations, and there were no uh, serious uh, problems found uh, at, uh, at, at post-mortem examination. Frank's death was also attributed to cardiomyopathy, but doctors were unable to identify the specific disease that would soon claim two more members of the Santos family. In August of 1987, another brother, 30-year-old Ralph, fell asleep on the sofa and never woke up. His death was also attributed to a viral infection of the heart. He left behind a wife and two young sons. Then in November of 1991, 15-year-old Frank Santos Jr. was struck down at a high school dance. The mysterious malady had skipped to the next generation. Frank's mother was called to the gym she had now lost a husband and a son. I walked in and I knew right when I saw him laying there still and, and the paramedics were uh, administering CPR, I knew, I knew he was gone. 
pain lingers in our heart over the loss of Frank. Frank Santos Jr. was buried next to his uncle Ronnie. Nearby are the graves of his father, his aunt Doris, and his uncle Ralph. The funeral was a time for Steve Santos, the family's only surviving son, to reflect on his own uncertain future. You know, I was thinking I might, I might be next, you know, or, or is my sister going to be next or, you know, one of us? I'm very certain that this is a problem that is in the genetic code, and we have just not been smart enough to figure out exactly what this problem is. It's not like we've seen 100 or 150 families like this with the exact same findings that we can, that we can look very, very carefully. Uh, this is a very unusual situation. Despite the years of pain and hardship, and despite the loss of six loved ones, the Santos family has remained remarkably resilient, drawing from each other the strength and hope that modern medicine has been unable to provide. It just brought us that much closer to each other. Now I have a three-month-year-old daughter. You know, I fear for them just like I fear for myself and my sisters. You know, now that it's hit their generation, you know, I fear it very much. Every day I think about my children, my grandchildren. Uh, what's going to happen? And I'm not praying. I'm hoping I'm praying that they will die. I just hope that this is going to stop. It's enough already. Next, controversy surrounds a fatal car fire. Was it an accident or a murder? On October 25th, 1987, in the small town of New Rockford, North Dakota, an angry confrontation erupted between Kathy Bonderson and her husband over their teenage son who had gone out without permission. What am I supposed to do about missing a night at work? You're the one that grounded him in the first place. Somebody has to set some limits for the boy, and obviously it's not going to be you. It was after 2 a.m. Kathy's husband had already conducted a cursory search and given up. He'll be home when he's ready. This is ridiculous. It's 2.30 in the morning, and we don't know where our son is. Fine. You go look for him, then. OK, I will. Yeah, well, I hope you have a heck of a lot better luck than I did. Kathy, a dedicated employee at a local convalescent home, had never missed a shift at work. Yet this night, she was so concerned about her son that she called in sick. Around 2.30 AM, the boy was on his way home with his girlfriend when he saw his mother's car heading out of town. That was my mom's car. Jeez, I hope she didn't see me. Another vehicle was following close behind Kathy's. Her son assumed that his mother was driving her car, but in fact, he was unable to clearly see the driver in either vehicle. An hour later, a car was reported burning out of control on a lonely country road just a few yards west of a railroad crossing. Open the line. Open the line now. Make sure the pressure's way up. The pressure's up. Put it on the hood. Somebody get the hood. I got it. I got it. The heat was intense. Get over it. Back. So Wait. intense get that 15 it. long minutes passed before firefighters could get close enough to look inside. No one on this side. Yes, check the other side. A body was in a seated position on the floorboard of the passenger side There's of the vehicle. The victim was later identified as 35-year-old Kathy Bonderson. Daybreak. Finally, the car had cooled down enough to remove Kathy's charred body. 
At the time, Edward Almaris was the sheriff of Eddy County. And as I remember it, the firewall was completely burned, the steering column, the dash, the front seat. The only thing that was left was the steel. Uh, listen, I, I'd like to have you have the boys flush it out, so if there's any fragments left from the body... The fire had to start up front someplace. There could have been a short, a wire pinch, something, because that car was doing some bending also when it went across those tracks. Kathy's car was found here. Sheriff Almaris believed that as Kathy approached the railroad crossing, she inexplicably swerved to the right and lost control when she careened over the exposed tracks. The car made a abrupt turn as if it was trying to avoid something, then straightened out, went across the tracks. There was marks on the tracks, which showed us that the car very definitely went over the tracks, not the crossing, but the tracks. Almaris believed that a high-speed impact with the raised tracks not only caused the car to burst into flames, but also threw Kathy to the passenger side of the car. Sheriff Almaris felt that he had an open and shut case. Kathy Bonnerson was no doubt the victim of a tragic accident. Yet oddly, her car keys were found virtually undamaged on the floorboard of the vehicle, even though the car's interior had melted. Within two days, a theory emerged which would pit Sheriff Almaris against an investigator from the North Dakota State Highway Patrol. Four years later, the two lawmen still disagree, and the question remains, did Kathy Bonnerson die in an accident? Or was she murdered? The day after the fire, Captain William Byram of the Highway Patrol visited the scene to file a standard report. It was an unusual case. It didn't seem to have the same characteristics that a normal accident would have. Granted, I arrived 24 hours later, but I could not distinguish any marks where a car had left the roadway. Byram found no tire tracks to indicate that an out-of-control car had veered off the road. Further, the tall grass in the area seemed undisturbed. He noticed the same marks on the railroad tracks which Sheriff Almaris had discovered. Byram, however, believes they were not made by Kathy's car. The marks I found were a reddish color. We talked with the firemen, and the hoses that were used that night were a red rubber hose. And they had been in and around that area, drug the hoses over the tracks, um, felt that what I was looking at was something that had been put there by them. The next day, Byram and the state fire marshal examined Kathy Bonderson's car. I see that it's totally burned, but I see absolutely no damage structural-wise from impact, which is normal to find in this type of an accident. But I couldn't find any. Found none. Zero. The fuel line looks OK, and the fuel filter still has the paint on it. Well, Surprisingly, know, the fuel tank like still held 12 and a half gallons of gasoline. The fuel line from the tank itself to the carburetor was intact. No cracks, no dents, no, no damage whatsoever. It doesn't appear that we had any impact on any rail. Based on the evidence, the fire marshal came to his own disturbing conclusion. It appeared the fire started in several different areas, which would not be normally found in an accidental fire. There's no question in my mind this fire was not an accident. This fire was intentionally set. Three weeks later, Captain Byron requested that Kathy Bonderson's body be exhumed for an autopsy. Sheriff Almaris objected. Byron threatened to obtain a court order. Almaris backed down. You know, it ticked me off when I was forced into signing the, the petition to exhumed the body, you know. 
And then after we got the the full um, wrap up from the uh, doctor in in uh, in Minnesota, the one who performed the autopsy, he couldn't come up with any cause of of death. One of the very important facts from the autopsy proved that Kathy Bonnerson was dead before the fire started. According to the pathologist's findings, there was no carbon monoxide in Kathy's lungs, suggesting that she was not alive when the fire was ignited. I asked him, you know, if she could have been killed from a, a, a blow on the head, and she, he says, yes. Well, if you're ever in a bouncing car, you know where your head is going to hit. Tests conducted on fragments of Kathy's clothing and the vehicle's carpeting reveal that each contained traces of gasoline, supporting the possibility of arson. Further, several days after the incident, an empty gasoline jug was found just 300 yards from where the car was burned. Still, Sheriff Elmaris would not change his findings. There's been no proof offered Nothing in my investigation brought up anything that, that even uh, would give you an inkling that, there, that, that this might be a homicide rather than a car accident. Nothing. There are too many other facts leading me to believe that it was not an accident. And I have to work with facts. Captain Byram is convinced that someone murdered Kathy Bonderson and set her car on fire to make it look like an accident. If so, who killed her and why? Eight fifty one PM, November thirteenth, nineteen ninety one. A chilling call came into the Vallejo, California police. Loomis driver said they pulled up the store and see a subject tied on the floor, possibly subjects inside. Patrol cars immediately rolled to the scene of what they believed was a robbery in progress at the Loomis Armored Car Company. As police made their approach, they saw that the security door of the main building was partially open. A bag of money lay near the entrance. The officers moved cautiously, fearful that somewhere a gunman might still be lurking. Inside, police discovered that this was far more than a simple robbery. Just beyond the door, a security guard lay dead. His hands had been bound with rope, and he'd been shot through the head. In another part of the building, police found two other guards. One was dead, the other mortally wounded. Like the first victim, they had each been bound and shot in the head. The guards were identified as 49-year-old Martin McCumber, 29-year-old Dennis Jacobson, and 25-year-old Alfonso Lontayo. McCumber left behind a wife and children. Lontayo was engaged to be married in six months. This one will forever stick in my mind as being a very brutal and senseless killing of three innocent people who were trying to make a living. And 
the way they were killed and just the brutality of the incident will be something that will stick in my mind for a pretty long time. The brutality of this crime was not its only hallmark. Police were surprised to find that the killers had left behind an abundance of physical evidence. All of that evidence has been used in our recreations. Watch closely. Perhaps someone in the audience will be able to help identify the killers. Immediately after police units had secured the crime scene, detectives were called in. We looked inside numerous duffel bags that had been left behind. Inside these duffel bags, we found a pair of shoes, we found some tools, and some lighter fluid. The lighter fluid itself is still somewhat of a mystery to us. Try as we might, we have not been able to conceive of the purpose of bringing that lighter fluid to the facility. A price had been handwritten on the lighter fluid container. So far, no match for the writing has been found. The shoes were a brand called Honors, sold exclusively at Target chain stores. It looks like one of the Detectives were surprised to find that the murder weapon had been left behind. This revolver is an eight inch blue steel Colt Trooper. We were able to determine that that weapon had been reported as previously lost or stolen in the Los Angeles area in approximately 1969. By the next morning, the FBI had been called in. At every turn, more evidence was discovered. Inside the compound, investigators found an orange duffel bag stuffed with hundreds of thousands of dollars. Nearby, they found the bolt cutters, which had been used to break in through the wire fence. As we traveled along the fence line of Loomis, we uh, located a, a pair of gloves that were maybe 15 to 20 feet from that cut hole in the fence. Beyond that, we began locating ski masks, gloves, camouflage or fatigue type clothing. We found another one of those large bags. Inside that bag was an abundance of currency. It too appeared to have been abandoned. In a park across the street, investigators found a pair of gloves, a ski mask, and an AK-47 assault rifle. Looks like it's been matted. Nearby where this AK-47 was found, we found an impression in the ground. This impression leads us to believe that the responsible laid in that area for some time following the crime, hoping that the police would leave and he could finish his escape. Judging from the evidence, the authorities theorize that there were four robbers. Hair samples found on the ski masks indicated that at least one of them was white and one black. Eyewitnesses would later confirm this. FBI agent here. Okay. How you doing, sir? Very good. Good. Exactly one week to the hour after the murders, authorities set up a roadblock near the armored car facility, hoping to find people who traveled the area regularly. They learned that a white male was seen running north from the building at around 9 p.m. on November 13th. A black male was seen around the same time running north on a different street. Working backwards, authorities began to piece together what happened on the night of the murders. At approximately 8 p.m., four heavily armed men dressed in combat fatigues approached the Loomis building. One security guard was on duty inside. Forty minutes later, two other guards arrived, transporting a significant amount of cash. They made radio contact with a guard inside the building, who was stationed in a lookout booth called the turret room. Several Loomis trucks were parked on the inside of the fence. This would have provided the responsibles with easy cover so as not to be seen by the guard inside the turret room. Once the truck arrived and the gate began to open, it would have been possible for the murderers to enter the facility, coming in underneath the opening gate quickly before the guards had a chance to respond. Your head. 
they could have held the guards as hostages, ordering the guard to exit the turret room, which he may have done, thinking that that would save the lives of his friends. Once all three of these guards were overpowered, they were then bound. Once the guards were bound, that allowed the responsibles to focus their attention on the truck. Get down! There was no reason to kill them other than if for some reason they could possibly identify the, the, the robbers. That would be the only reason that they would have to be killed. Now this leads to a great deal of speculation whether one or more of the employees who were killed actually knew one of the robbers. When a gunshot was fired, they activated an interior alarm which caused them to panic and flee. They filled the bags so full of money that they could not carry them. They were not aware of how heavy money actually is. Despite the blaring alarm, the killers fled and got away scot-free. The stark irony is that they also got away with absolutely no money. These three victims of this crime were more than just guards. They had wives, children, girlfriends, fathers and mothers that they left behind. These people's lives, their survivors, have been permanently impacted. Nothing can be ever done to undo what's been done to those people. And probably the closest we can ever come to rectifying the impact on their life is to help solve this crime. Next, a woman is stricken with a rare form of amnesia and loses 16 years of her memory. Imagine what it would be like to awake one day from a deep sleep and discover that your most precious memories are gone forever. That's exactly what happened to a 39-year-old housewife from Dundalk, Maryland. She's been stricken with amnesia a medical mystery which has confounded science for centuries. She is not searching for a lost loved one. No crime has been committed. What she has lost is every single memory from a 16-year period. The mystery of Sarah de Janeiro is a mystery of the mind. Thank you. Hello. I just want to cash that, please. Sure. <laughs> It began on Friday the 13th, August 1976, when Sarah stopped by her local bank. Sarah had a long history of debilitating migraine headaches, but this day, I'm the sorry, pain was beyond bad. anything she had ever experienced before. Ma'am? The pain was so bad. Uh, if my head had exploded, you know, if dynamite had gone off on the left side of my head, it would have probably felt the same way. There was so much pain Ma are you all right? that the only thing I could do was leave there. Mrs. De Janeiro. The attack left Sarah confused and disoriented, unable to see out of her left eye. Somehow, she managed to make her way home. Honey? Honey, what's wrong? Three hours later, Sarah's husband, Paul, found his wife sprawled across the bed. Honey, wake up. She was partially paralyzed and babbling incoherently. Honey, honey, talk to me. I tell tried me to tell honey. him, you know, that I was honey. down at the bank and my felt like my head exploded, and I but I couldn't couldn't say it. 
A blood vessel had burst in Sarah's brain. Doctors recommended an extremely delicate and risky operation. The alternative was bleak. Sarah would likely be incapacitated for the rest of her life. Okay, you're bringing the pressure down. Okay, the clip is on. Surgeons use a relatively new and experimental procedure called microsurgery to repair the broken blood vessel in Sarah's brain. All right, we've got the first aneurysm clipped. It looks like there's another aneurysm here, though, that we didn't... Then they discovered that her condition was worse than they had imagined. There was a second ruptured vessel, which had failed to show up in x-rays. Sarah was on the operating table for nine and a half grueling hours as doctors struggled to save her life. Sarah, how are you doing? Listen, the doctor says we can remove some of those stitches now that are in your head. During the first few days of recovery, Sarah knew something was not quite right and became frightened. She noticed that in just three days, Paul's 1960s crew cut had grown out and he appeared to have put on weight. Sarah's daughter, Kelly, sensed immediately that her mother had changed. What Kelly did not know was that her mother did not even recognize her. I can remember the day that my father took me to the hospital. It was after my mother was out of intensive care and she was in her private room. And it also happened to be the day that she was getting her stitches out. So as the, the nurse was removing the stitches from her head, I was to one side of her. And I kept watching her and she would be looking over at me just out of the corner of her eye and not really saying anything to me at all the whole time that I was there. I was wondering who I was. Are you doing okay? 16 years of Sarah's memory had been erased. In her mind, she was only 23 years old and had three youngsters waiting for her at home, not four teenage children. Most people who have a, an aneurysm that ruptures do experience some memory loss. But the memory loss tends to be around the event itself, not a prolonged period of time that is lost. Uh, in Mrs. DiGennaro's case, uh, 16 years, a uh, time when children were being born <laughs> and were growing, uh, to be deprived of that is really uh, unusual. Two and a half weeks after surgery, Sarah was released from the hospital. The neighborhood seemed oddly out of kilter. What had once been a dirt road was now a paved street. Where there were once empty lots, new houses stood. Okay. Who's here? Kids, kids are here. Doctors had warned Sarah that following the surgery, she might feel slightly disoriented. Hi, Mom. But no one had prepared her for what she found. Right over here. There was nothing in the house like it was before. Everything was just Good. different. Yeah, that's fine. But I figured that uh, if I just kept quiet, I eventually I'd have things figured out. Do Eloise and Bob still live in Towson? Two days after oh, returning yeah. from the hospital, Sarah began to understand the full magnitude of her problem. And it is 1960, isn't it? No. It's 1976, Mom. You're kidding us, right? Yeah, I'm just fooling you guys. I knew that. Terrified by her inexplicable memory loss, Sarah made a conscious decision that no one must know. Not her family, not her friends, not even her doctors. Whenever she was alone, Sarah sifted through family photographs, searching for clues about her past. She became obsessed with discovering who she was and where she had come from. I didn't have all the knowledge that I had before. I would try to uh, get back everything that, I'd, you know, that was lost in my brain. Sarah found herself mystified by the most ordinary household appliances. When Sarah was 23, few families had automatic dishwashers. Microwave ovens had not yet been invented. Personal computers were unheard of. Even the family car seemed like something out of the space age. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. I mean, here was this big, streamlined car. 
It was unbelievable. The magazines, they used to give uh, pictures of cars of the future. That's what the Pontiac Grand Prix looked like. Sarah internalized her fears and tried to go about life as if nothing had happened. Yet everything had changed. Sarah's taste in music, fashion, and dance was that of a 23-year-old, not a woman approaching middle age. I can remember coming home from school or coming home from work, and the stereo would just be blasting. And the first thing I would do would be to come in the back door and just turn the stereo down, because it would just drive me crazy. It's just been a real role reversal at some points, you know, and just the music that she listens to. You know, it's music of my generation, and, and it's a bit much for me at times. <laughs> For nearly four years, Sarah managed to keep up her charade. Finally, in November of 1979, Sarah discovered that she was not alone. Kelly, Kelly, yeah. come here and sit down. An article in the local newspaper gave her the courage to reveal her secret to her family. I just read an article about people who have aneurysms, right? And for years now, I thought there was something wrong with me. Everything was out, and she, you know, was willing to admit that she did not know who we were or know who I was. Sometimes I wish that she could remember me as when I was younger and I was growing up, because I think I did get some characteristics from her, such as being athletic, that I think she would have really enjoyed remembering of me. We always hope that we can learn from the experiences of our patients, and by that process continue to grow intellectually. But from time to time, an event will occur that remains inexplicable, a mystery. Now that's a big difference. Today, with the help of her family, Sarah is trying to reconstruct the year she thought she had lost forever. I didn't know as much as I did at one time and uh, wasn't able to do the things I could do before. Oh, that's me. Uh, that's you, nothing was going to get me down. I was going to relearn everything. You know, handicapped people are, everybody goes, oh, isn't that a shame? And they weren't going to do that to me. Despite tremendous advances in the field of medicine, Scientists tell us that we understand even less than 5% of how our memory functions. Sarah DiGennaro is still adjusting to life with 16 years of missing time. Though she carries on bravely, her doctors do not foresee the day that Sarah will recover her lost memories. On our next Unsolved Mysteries, Three suspicious deaths, all investigated as possible suicides, haunt a freelance journalist who now believes he has been targeted for murder because he may know too much about possibly illegal, multi-million dollar gold transactions. On June 26, 1990, in Rochester, New York, one of the largest armored car robberies in United States history went off without a hitch. The total haul, over $10 million in untraceable bills. Join me next time. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery.